All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Passing the CIPTV2 300-75 Exam Webinar Number 1 of the CCNA CCMP Collaboration Webinar Series hosted by Fastlane and presented by Joey DeWeel. First, a few housekeeping items. All attendees, please leave your audio on mute to prevent any audio interference. We will be taking questions in the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen during the presentation, and then at the end, Joey will answer all of the questions that are not covered by the presentation. Also, the slides and audio recording of today's presentation will be emailed out to all attendees within a week. Please look for the email from Fastlane Training. Now, I'm going to go and hand things off to Joey. I'll just unmute myself first, and then we can properly get started. Uh, so good afternoon if uh, if you're in the same time zone as us. Um, otherwise, good day, and welcome to our webinar, Understanding the CIPTAV2 300-075 exam. So let's get started. Okay, so the CIPTAV2 300-075 exam, and I'll just call it the CIPTAV2 exam from now on. It's the key to upgrading your CCNP voice certification to CCNP collaboration. So if you have CCNP voice and you pass the CIPTV2 exam, then you'll be upgraded to CCNP collaboration, which is a good thing and it's what we all want. Passing the exam also extends other certifications by three years. So the way that Cisco at Learning and, and Cisco works uh, through these certifications is if you pass a major exam, it's going to extend other certifications by several years. Now, the CIPTV2 exam is difficult. Many find the test difficult. I know that I found it difficult. I did not pass this on my first try. I didn't pass it on my second try either. I had to develop a, uh, a strategy for figuring out what's on the exam, what do I need to study, how should I prepare myself, and we'll talk about that um, in this presentation. The CIPTV2 Foundation Learning Guide, CCNP Collaboration Exam 300-075, CIPTV2, that's the full name of that learning guide. It does not have all the answers. This uh, is confusing for a lot of people. A lot of people think, look, if I buy this learning guide and I study it thoroughly, then I'll be able to pass the exam. That is not the case. Okay, and that's something that uh, I found confusing when I got started on this as well. I assumed that what was in the CIPDV2 course, that would be the basis for the questions on the exam. And again, that it's just not the way it works. Okay, in order to pass, you need to know what's on the exam, you need to know what material to study, you need a study method, and you need to allocate the time required given your background and experience. And we're gonna run through this process of figuring out what's on the exam finding the material to study and so on. Now, we're not going to give you the answers. This isn't a presentation where we just run through all of the examples or example questions that are actually on the test and show you the answers. So we're not doing that. What we're doing is showing you how to find the material, study, prepare, and pass the exam you know, without buying the answers. So this is what we're going to talk about, the blueprint, and the blueprint is vital. It is vital that you understand the blueprint. That tells you what's going to be on the exam, and from the blueprint you can then go and find uh, necessary study materials. You'll need a study method. We'll talk about that later, and you're going to need to allocate some time for study. This isn't something you can pick off in an afternoon. Right. This is actually a substantial effort. There's a lot of new material. If you're familiar with CIPTV2 voice, you're going to have a, a lot of work to come up to speed on things like VCS and MRA that's in this new blueprint. So the blueprint is vital. So 
So let's look at the blueprint first. And uh, here it is. There's a link here. I'm going to paste that link into the chat window. So let me just find it so that you'll have it. And I'll try and paste all of these links into the chat window so that you know, you'll have them and you can grab them as opposed to trying to copy them down. Okay, so if you were to click on the link that I just posted into the chat window, you'll come and see this web page uh, that's part of the Cisco Learning Network. And it's got an overview of the exam. It's got the blueprint, exam topics here. That is the blueprint. It's vital. Cisco at Learning has some recommendations for study material. We'll look at those. And there are some practice tests on the website. Okay, you need to review this carefully because it's the key to passing your CIPT V2 exam. Now, the first thing we'll look at is exam topics. Okay, so basically what I've done here is I've gone to the exam topics tab and you can see the list of topics broken down. So VCS control, collaboration edge, and so on, down to implement bandwidth management and call control. And here we see the percentages of questions associated with the individual topics. So you need to use this to allocate time. So here we see VCS control and collaboration edge. That adds up to 29% of the test. And in fact, there's a little bit of VCS um, in topic five here. So VCS control and collaboration edge amount to roughly a third of the exam. So when you go to study, you have to think, look, a third of the exam is going to be on VCS and MRA, Collaboration Edge. Uh, I need to figure out how well do I know that material? Is that something new to me? If it's new to me, then you're going to have to spend a significant amount of time on these topics to come up to speed. So you want to look at the topics. You want to look at the percentages of questions that are going to be associated with that topic. And that will give you an idea of the test content. Okay, very important. Okay, this is a, a thing that a lot of people are confused about. And I've mentioned this already. Exam questions are not restricted to the content in either the course, the labs, or the foundation learning guide. Your first job, if you want to pass the test, is to find the right material to study. Put up uh, a little comment here from learning at Cisco, right, concerning what's on the exam. So I'm just reinforcing the point. All exam items are mapped 100% to the blueprints. Courses, labs, and guides are additional material, right, to assist you in studying and preparing for the exams but knowing that material is not a guarantee that you will pass the exam. Okay, and this is something that I found to be uh, important. You, you need to understand this because you can study the study guide until the end of time and you're not going to be able to pass this test. You really have to be conversant with the blueprint. Quickly, I'm going to run through the blueprint and then we'll talk about study material. So VCS topics make up about a third of the exam. So we see VCS control, collaboration edge. I won't uh, enumerate every one of the list items, but anything, for example, associated with VCS and integration with LDAP, you could get questions on that topic. Very important point. If you haven't worked a lot with VCS, you need to allocate enough time to come up to speed on these topics. And uh, this could take you literally man weeks, like 10, 15, 20 days. If you're not at all familiar with VCS, it's going to take quite a bit of time to go through the material, review it, understand it, summarize it, and, and be prepared to answer questions. We have questions about QoS, DSCP values, and cluster-wide system parameters. Questions about centralized call processing redundancy. Okay, and again, we'll talk about these in some more detail shortly. 
a multi-site uh, dial plan for Cisco Unified Communications Manager, you really need to understand E164, and you have to understand URI dial plans. E164 is uh, central to Cisco's approach now to building dial plans for multi-site deployments. You need to understand globalization and localization, how to configure it, what it is, how it works. Call Control Discovery ILS includes SAF, uh, the Service Advertisement Framework, and Global Dial Plan Replication. Uh, these things are problematic for some people. Not a lot of people have deployed SAF or GDPR. So if, if you haven't deployed these, and there's 14% of the exam that covers those topics, Again, you're going to have to allocate the time to find the material to study, to summarize the information that you study, and to prepare for the exam. Video mobility features, extension mobility, device mobility, unified mobility. We'll have questions from these on the exam, right, up to 9% of the questions. And bandwidth management, regions, transcoders, MTPs. Enhanced CAC, so that's including the new uh, locations bandwidth manager concept where you're advertising things in a multi-cluster network. Okay, so there we go, a quick look at the blueprint. So the next question here, study materials, what should you study? Okay, um, how do I know what to study? There's many topics, right? And there's probably uh, 10,000 pages of material out there on those topics, right? Uh, many different kinds of documents, SRNDs, deployment guides, administration and maintenance guides. There's the foundation learning guide. So the question is, what do I need to look at? Which of these should I be studying? Uh, to make it even more difficult, there's different versions of these products. The CIPT V2 course is focused on 10.5. Learning at Cisco Material references the 9.x SR&D. So you need to know something about 9 and you need to know something about 10 if you're going to pass the, the test. Now what we're going to do is help you get started here on identifying what it is that you need to study. There's some guidance. So we're going to start here. We're going to start with the Learning at Cisco study materials. So there's a page, uh, and it's, it's accessible through the link that uh, I sent into uh, the chat window that um, helps you find the material to study. Okay, there's also a community ask, right, for people to submit suggestions for quality materials to study. They all have to be Cisco approved, uh, Cisco approved study materials. Okay, so here's the list of things that Cisco has information for you in terms of where to go to find study material. It's important to understand that this list is not complete you have more work to do. For example, the VCS control and collaboration edge topics are missing. So if we look at the list of material to study, there's no reference to anything associated with VCS control or collaboration edge. And again, that's a third of the exam. The material reference for the other topics is also not complete. So you, you can't view this as your one-stop shopping. Here are the documents that I need to study and learn to pass the exam. You have to look at the blueprint, and you have to be sure you cover off the topics in the blueprint. So we started looking at this. We looked at what's on the Cisco at Learning web page to understand this topic, right? The Configure CUCM Video Service Parameters topic. It includes configured DSCP values, configuring cluster-wide parameters such as system QoS. Learning at Cisco has um, this recommendation for you. Look at the foundation learning guide to understand the material associated with DSCP and cluster-wide QoS parameters. 
Unfortunately, the foundation learning guide doesn't cover configuring DSCP or, or cluster-wide parameters, system QoS at all. So this uh, recommendation is a little off. There's nothing in this guide or the course for that matter that will help you to study for these two topics. So what are you going to do, right? We don't have any information here at Learning at Cisco. Well, you don't want to give up. You want to think about it. So this is our message to you for these topics. Give this some thought, right? Understand what they're asking, right? And start with the basics, right? So if we go back, well, we're configuring cluster-wide parameters, system QoS. It's easy enough to find those parameters. We navigate here in the Communications Manager to System, Service, Parameters, Call Manager, Cluster-wide System, QoS. And here are the list of values, right? So we should certainly know something about this. It's on the list of topics in the blueprint. Uh, do we need to memorize this list of DSCP values? Probably not, but you probably know some, should know some high runners. DSCP for audio, DSCP for video, DSCP for telepresence. You can go through and, and pick out a few more, but you should certainly know some of the high runner values here. Expedited forwarding, DSCP value 46 for audio calls, and so on. And again, you have to think to yourself, it's 9% of the exam, so I can only spend 9% of my study time on this. So again, think about it, start with the basics. I've gone to cluster-wide QoS parameters and I found things that I can study. If DSCP values are important, then you probably should uh, understand some things about DSCP values, our assured forwarding settings, AF11, 12, 13 for class one, and, and so on. I won't read these all out, but again, going back to our study materials, cluster-wide parameter system QoS, we've got a bunch of DSCP values. It's useful to understand the relationship between for example, AF41 and DSCP34, and I've gone one step further here. I've uh, gone and I've found a picture that shows me what DSCP values are used for different kinds of calls between different kinds of devices. So from the 10.x, CUCM SRND, I've seen it, CS4 for immersive video, AF4 for uh, calls between video phones, AF31 from a streaming server, EF for audio. So, and again, I want to repeat this, right? Our philosophy here when we're looking at this is look at the topic, right? See if Cisco has any information that we should look at. And then think about it. Ask ourselves some questions about what we should know. I went and found the cluster-wide QoS parameters. I see the display. I have to know something about this. I went and looked up a little bit more about DSCP values, and I looked at what devices are using which values for which kinds of calls between which kinds of devices. I could ask myself, what else should I study? Okay, where else do you configure DSCP values? Well, you configure them on switches. You configure them on routers, right? We will do um, mapping between layer two and layer three on switches. We've got low latency queuing on routers. I'm not gonna talk about any of that. I'm just gonna say, look, remember, you've only got 9% of the exam on questions on this topic. Manage your time. Okay, so, so hopefully that, that's making some sense. Let's move on and look at the next topic. Describe and implement centralized call processing redundancy. So I've had a look at what Cisco at Learning has to say. And again, I, I see there's some new people have joined. I'm just gonna pop the link so you can find this material back into chat.
Okay. So I pop that back into chat. You can find this um, at that link. Okay, so we're looking at um, study materials, centralized call processing redundancy. Here's what Cisco's recommending. Now, there's a 12-minute uh, uh, online learning thing you can buy through Cisco. I did not have a look at that. Uh, the SR&D has some useful information. So does the foundation learning guide. But you're really going to have to dig deeper than that foundation learning guide if you want to be able to uh, actually pass the exam. Okay, so again, our motto here is think about it. What kinds of questions can they ask about these topics? Right, device failover, call survivability, these two things are related. So what we're discussing here is if I have a phone, I'm on a phone call, my primary call manager fails, fails over to the secondary call manager, does the call stay up or not? I have a call going through an H323 gateway and the primary call manager for the gateway fails. Does the call stay up or not? Do I need anything to configure uh, for that case? Um, we have SRST, right? We need to understand SRST and we need to know something about testing. Well, again, start with the basics. Uh, from here, I went into the CUCM system guide and I wanted to look up call survivability. Call survivability is really the same thing as call preservation. So here are some of the basics. This is a discussion, and I know you can't, you probably can't read this, but you can find it in the CUCM system guide. It might be in the SRND as well. You just find that system guide and do a search on call preservation, and you'll find this an explanation about what call preservation is, uh, devices and applications that support call preservation or call survivability, things that do not. So there's a start. We need to look at uh, things like SRST configuration, right? So start with the basics. Uh, some people do SRST configuration all the time. Others rarely do this. You know, if you're working at uh, a large site, you're working at a hospital and they have a fiber ring, uh, you may not have any routers deploying SRST. But there are questions on this and you need to go to uh, documentation to find out um, how it works to um, build summaries in crib notes or whatever to understand how to pass the exam. Let me just put that URL into chat here so you have that. Okay, I'll try and remember to put these URLs into chat as we go past them. So that's basic skinny SRST configuration. But again, think about it. This is um, the certification just below CCIE. It's a professional certification. We now have SIP SRST. We have SRST with CME. So I've downloaded the uh, SCCP and SIP SRST admin guide. Um, there's lots of detail here, but you know, it's 300 pages and you have only so much time. Right? You have to manage your time. Think about the kinds of questions you might be asked. Look at basic configuration first. Look at show commands for verification. Make sure you understand MGCP issues. Right? When you're configuring SRST, fallback MGCP is a, a big part of that. Right? So that when your phones re-register to the gateway, Call managers down, um, we still have calling out through a, a PRI or whatever. So we moved on here, and, and again, in this presentation, I'm not going to show you exactly what to study for each of these topics. We don't actually have enough time for this, so what I'm going to try to do is show you some things and, and give you an approach 
to figuring out what you need to do to pass, what you need to look at to study. So the next topic, describe and configure a multi-site dial plan for Cisco Unified Communications Manager. So Cisco Learning has a couple of things for you to look at. There's a case study, how Cisco India simplified VoIP and PSTN calls with logical partitioning. Um, this case study is really old. Um, it references things that are happening in 2004. Uh, the, for me, I could navigate to the link to the presentation. Just recently, I was able to look at the presentation a couple of months ago, but it doesn't seem to have a correct link. Um, the feature that's being discussed here, I don't believe is relevant. Logical partitioning, uh, I don't see that on the topic, topic list. So I, I wouldn't worry about this case study. The foundation guide uh, provides some useful information here. Um, a lot of this is E164. A lot of it is URI dialing. You can find a lot of information in this uh, on this topic in the learning guide and also in the SRND. So it's vital for E164. You know what globalization is. You know how to globalize incoming calls, the called and calling party ID. You need to know how to localize outgoing calls, so you strip the plus one for a local call, and so on and so forth. You need to know that in order to understand these topics. Okay, so again, I'm talking to the topics on the blueprint. Call control discovery ILS. Uh, this section is um, particularly difficult. Here, most people that I know have no experience with SAF at all, the service advertisement framework. That's where you configure a router to be a SAF forwarder, and you can um, exchange dial plan information between clusters. That can be done automatically uh, so that there's uh, no manual reconfiguration of the clusters as you grow your dial plan. Um, ILS and Global Dial Plan Replication, it's actually a typo, it should be GDPR, sorry about that. Um, that's something that's uh, of more interest today. People have started deploying this, um, and in particular to get SIP URI dialing going in a uh, multi-cluster environment. But for a lot of people, a lot of people have no experience with this, and so you have to figure out how to spend your time to answer the 14% of the questions that are going to be on this topic. We looked up some SAF material. Let me just find that link for you. And I will post it into chat. So uh, SAF materials, if you want to go beyond the learning guide, right, and the SRD, and again, it's all up to you, right? When you're looking at how much time to allocate, think about what do I know, how much time do I have, what's the documentation available, and then you allocate your time appropriately. If you want to go beyond what's in the foundation learning guide, then this is a, a really good source of material. Uh, I found a chapter on global dial plan replication uh, that um, was extremely good in the CUCM uh, services feature guide. Feature services guide. Let me just find that link as well so I can pop that in. So you'll have that. So again, what we need to do is looking at the topics in the blueprint, try and find out from Cisco Learning if they have recommendations, and then go one step farther so you, you have the right material collected to study. Moving on, video mobility features. We have extension mobility, device mobility, unified mobility. Um, what do I need to learn? Cisco Learning, we have uh, a link to Mobility Solutions Extend Cisco Unified Communications. 
that's actually a marketing page. Uh, I wouldn't recommend uh, you worry about that, but these lower two links actually have some quite useful information. But again, you want to think about it. Think about what you might need to know. So here I'm looking at device mobility. And when I looked at device mobility, I thought to myself, how can I summarize this in as small an amount of paper as possible so that I can remember it for the exam? And we'll talk about this a little bit later. What I did was build crib notes, right? So here's an example of a page from my crib notes. Device mobility is about devices that roam and various parameters change. And there's two kinds of parameters, roaming sensitive settings and device mobility related information. But these are parameters within the device pool. These change, the roaming sensitive settings when you move to a new physical location. These change, the device mobility related information settings when you move to a new physical location in the same device mobility group. Now, for device mobility, there's not that much more to know. You know, if a device moves, it gets a new IP address. The IP address identifies a physical location in a device mobility group. If we've moved, we change these settings as indicated. So for device mobility, I basically built the crib note with the one, the one page here. What other kinds of questions can they ask? Okay, so what about extension mobility? Well, think about it. How do we configure it, right? You need to um, build the extension mobility service. We need device profiles, and there's different kinds of device profiles. There are user device profiles, default device profiles, auto-generated device profiles. Do you know the difference between these three kinds of profiles? Right, um, something to think about. I mean, if you don't, then you probably don't know enough to answer the questions on the topic. What about service parameters and behavior? There's a service parameter that says whether you can have multiple logins, whether when you log in a second time, you log out the original user or the, the original location. Um, we can have the parameter say multiple logins not allowed. So there's some service parameters. You need to think about it. What do you think you need to know? And then you need to identify that, build yourself some sort of summary, and try and memorize the information. Same thing with mobile connect and mobile voice access, right? How do we configure it? What kind of behavior do we need to understand? Bandwidth management and call control. So if we run through this topic, we have configure regions, transcoders and MTPs, locations, and enhanced CAC. So we're, we're getting questions about location bandwidth manager and multi-cluster updates, right? So we're, we're implementing locations in a multi-cluster environment. This part's really difficult. To correlate events based on traces, logs, debugs, and output of monitoring tools, you could spend a week looking at just this, right, uh, at debugs and logs. But it's only 12% of the exam, so you have to think, how much time am I going to spend? Think about it. Well, what we did, certainly, when we think about it, the first thing I did was I went into service parameters to start looking up information about codecs, right? Default intra-region max audio bit rate, default intra and inter-region max audio bit rates. I familiarized myself with the cluster-wide parameters. We're talking about locations and regions, so that's a start. You can go into the call manager and look at region and location configuration and just look and see what it says. I, I haven't done this here, but I certainly did that to study. Start simple, right? Uh, you know, I wouldn't start on trying to figure out what all the debugs are. You run out of time just looking at that. So what I did was I started with, well, I actually started with this, right? Some basic views of what's in the call manager. 
I looked at RTMT counters, right? There's counters under Cisco locations in RTMT. There's a call manager counter. There are location bandwidth manager counters. There's a lot of out-of-resources counters, right? Counters named out-of-resources. So I familiarized myself with uh, these counters. Okay, so again, think about it. What should we know about transcoders and MTPs? How to configure them? Hardware versus software? Service parameters and behavior? What about enhanced locations? How to configure it? Behavior? You could look in the SRND. The Foundation Learning Guide also provides some information. What about this content? VCS Control and Collaboration Edge? Um, we don't have a lot of time, and again, there's only so much depth we can go into this in a 45-minute presentation, but you know, I started with some basic VCS info, basic configuration, single VCS control. I moved on to look at what's in the VCS administrator guide. I did a lot of lab work, right? I have access to a lab, so I was able to do some lab work. Trunking from CUCM to VCS is specifically called out. I looked at these two documents, VCS SIP Trunk to Unified CM Deployment Guide, Cisco Expressway SIP Trunk to Unified CM Deployment Guide. The configuration procedures here are, are basically the same, right? Whether I'm going to VCS Control or Cisco Expressway C, I, I ended up looking at both of them, but they turn out to be basically identical. I looked at Expressway and MRA. I looked at the Cisco Expressway Basic Configuration Deployment Guide. I looked at the Mobile Remote Access via Expressway Deployment Guide. Okay, so just just to complete this for the VCS material, um, I've identified a set of documents here. Okay, that I personally went through and looked at, right? Um, and there's a lot of pages in all of these documents. If you actually do general searches, you're going to find uh, dozens, if not hundreds of documents with thousands, if not tens of thousands of pages of, of material. So at, at some point, you have to figure out how you're going to restrict your effort, right? You only have so much, so much time. The study methods. So I've identified all of these documents that I'm going to use as a, a potential um, as potential study material. Now, what am I going to do with this? Say you come up with a thousand pages of of documentation, and you're going to end up with more than that for sure. What are the ways that you have to study? Read and reread. Take notes and summarize. You can practice doing labs, and you can practice with practice tests. So let's talk about these. Read and reread. Maybe good for a first step, but problematic as a complete solution. When I was younger, if I read something three times, I normally remembered it. Now I have to read it 10 or 12 times. Um, and as well, when you're looking at these complex technical documents, uh, it's it you know the more that you read the harder it is the harder it is to remember some of the slight differences between different kinds of implementation. So you know it's obviously a good first step, but is that going to get you all the way? Take notes and summarize. This is what I ended up doing. I started building crib notes, and we'll talk about these a little bit later and, and how that would or might work. We're not aware of any CIPTV2 practice labs other than the actual CIPTV2 labs. Okay, Cisco Learning Network doesn't have any CIPTV2 practice labs at the moment. I don't know if they're going to add them. Um, we don't actually believe that just doing the CIPTV2 labs is going to be adequate. Right, you're going to have to go deeper than that, right? So this is a, a difficult test. You're going to have to go deep. Oh, just excuse me. <coughs> so 
sorry, just needed a, a, a little drink of water. You could possibly try dCloud. Uh, we haven't uh, looked into that, but that doesn't seem like a way, uh, a mechanism for building a study lab. But it is there as an option. Uh, you, you could investigate it. Practice questions. What I found when I was at university was the best way to study for an exam was to do practice questions, right? Uh, you would do questions from earlier exams um, in all of the uh, uh, books that I had. They, they had lots and lots of questions in them that you could go through and do questions and answers. Uh, the Cisco Learning Network, they only have nine practice questions. Uh, there's some practice questions in the learning guide if you uh, if you buy that. But uh, I have to warn you, getting 100% on these practice questions does not mean that you can pass the test. And it's the same thing for the questions and answers in the learning guide. Um, it, it doesn't it doesn't even necessarily mean you're ready for the test. I took these nine practice questions and I, I was able to get all nine of them right and then I subsequently um, miserably failed the exam because you know I hadn't really looked at the content uh, in the blueprint. Okay, so getting 100% on these does not mean that you can pass the test. You can search the internet, right, and you can find many CIPT V2 practice tests. Okay, none of them are approved, except for those ones we just looked at in the previous slide. Using them to prep would be considered cheating if the questions on the practice test are copies of the real test questions. And you won't have the job skills necessary. So, you know, if you go and buy the answers, and some of these these websites that sell test questions are selling you the real test questions. So that that's basically cheating. If you download those, look at the questions and answers and memorize them. So something to be aware of, right? We, we don't really have the opportunity here when we're studying for CIP TV2 to do practice questions. There, there isn't really a a very good list of questions out there that are approved. So a tried and true method, um, I have a degree, my degree is in engineering mathematics, so I had a lot, a lot of studying to do in university and generally what I tried to do was build crib notes. So here's an example of CUCM, SIP trunk to VCS crib notes. So what I've done is I've gone through the document we looked at earlier. There's, um, you know, we we I, I put up a slide that had a specific. And let's actually go back and find it here. I went to these two documents, and the summary turns out to be basically the same. And I tried to summarize the content. And I always find it nice if I can put the content on one page. It's it's really hard to do that in many cases. But this is a summary of building a SIP trunk between the communications manager and VCS. Uh, this is unsecured. So on the CUCM, I need a SIP profile for the devices, SIP profile for the trunk, SIP trunk security profile. I listed everything in, in order. What I need to do on VCS, I've listed in order. For each of these items, in terms of what I need to do, I highlighted what was called out in the Cisco documentation. So in my SIP profile for devices, it calls out use fully qualified domain name and SIP request. So I looked that up and made sure I knew what that was. Allow presentation sharing using BFCP. This is a, a protocol for presentation sharing. So I made sure I, I knew that. We have the standard SIP profile for Cisco VCS. I had a look at that. That includes this new feature called SIP options ping. I had a look at that. That, that is a way to ensure that you know if a SIP trunk is up or not. I'm not going to run through everything here, but you get the idea. I've taken 
the configuration steps and I've summarized them and then I've called out particular things that were called out in the document and I've organized it in a, a one-page summary and then I could say to myself, well, if I can write this out on a clean piece of paper, then I know this. I did the same thing for a secure SIP trunk to VCS CribNotes. So I put in what are the extra steps if I want to secure this, right? And then for things like configure certificates, I identified the particular um, called out steps for configuring those certificates. And I arranged it all on a single page. Okay, study efforts. How much time should I spend preparing? Well, this is really difficult because it depends on, you know, things like how well do you remember things? You know, I've got friends who remember everything. Well, I don't have friends. I have a friend who seems to remember everything he ever reads, and he always passes these tests for minimal amounts of studying. Right, that's not true for me, and it's not true for a lot of us. Now look, if you've already got CCMP Voice, you know a lot about the stuff that's in CCMP Voice. What's new is VCS, Expressway, and MRA. If you know these things, then you've got a really good start. If you don't know VCS, Expressway, and MRA, you have a large effort. I say man weeks potentially, well, if you don't have any experience with these topics, uh, I would say man weeks surely, like 15 or 20 man days, right, to actually spend going through the documents, summarizing them, building crib notes, trying to remember what it is you studied. Okay? I put a note here, it's very difficult to know when are you ready. And really the only way to know, given that there aren't any practice tests that you can do, you have to take the exam, right? Once you think you're ready, take the exam. That will tell you if you were ready or not. Now, you know, I understand these exams are expensive at $250, but, you know, I, there's there's not much else you can do. Look at the blueprint, identify the material you need to study, study it, right? Build crib notes or do whatever you normally do to study, right? When you think you know the material, take the exam um, and it's quite likely that you'll fail the first time, right? A lot of people fail these exams on the first run. That will give you an idea of where it is that you know, that you're in good shape. The exam results will tell you what you scored for each of the topics so you can see where it is you need to study further. Okay, a little summary, okay? This exam is the key to upgrading your CCMP voice certification. We looked at the blueprint. We looked at some study materials and we talked about some study methods. We talked a little bit about the effort required. Now, we didn't give you any answers, okay, but, you know, hopefully we've helped you to get organized and prepared for the exam. We've got some related training here. So this is, these are some courses that uh, Fastlane um, is offering. And at Fastlane, we're, we're actually enhancing all of the CCNP collaboration courses. Uh, to include um, exam prep. So we're not going to give you questions and answers, but we'll talk about the blueprint in each course. And we started adding in uh, some crib notes into these courses so that we'll review crib notes, for example, the crib notes I just showed you, crib notes for URI dialing. Uh, we're trying to add in uh, crib notes for some of these newer, uh, newer topics. So there's the standard CIPT V2 course. The CIPT V2 bridge course, what we've done is we said, look, if, if you want to pass the CIPT V2 exam, but you've already done CIPT2, right? So you've done the five-day course that was the predecessor to CIPT V2. Well, this is a delta. This is focused on the new material in um, CIPT V2 material that was not there in the CIPT uh, 2 class. 
So these are our standard classes. And of course, we can customize uh, courses. So if you have a particular requirement for material that you want to study out of any of these courses, we can take these courses and slice and dice them for you and include the content that you uh, desire. Okay, so I just discussed this. Our CCMP Collab courses are being enhanced to discuss the blueprint, look at uh, in more detail than one, what we've got here about sources for study material. We're going to look at test preparation techniques and we're gonna build some crib notes for the blueprint content. Okay, so that's, um, that's thanks for watching. This is the, um, the conclusion of the webinar. I'm going to see now if anybody has any questions about this. We'll do a Q&A at this point. So I am open for questions. <clears throat> great, thank you, Joey. Um, that was a great presentation. Um, so the first question that I have um, is, how many days on average do you think a person should study for this exam? Do you say, you know, I think two weeks or a month, or what do you think? Well, that's a hard question because, again, it depends on what you know. If if you're not, a, if you haven't been exposed to VCS and MRA, then uh, I would be honest and, and say you're probably looking at uh, six weeks, six man weeks to come up to speed in in everything that's listed or more, depending on your ability to retain retain information. Um, if you're you know, out there every day and you're doing all of this stuff, MRA, Expressway, then you, you may be able to pass the test without studying at all. So for an average, it's very, it's very difficult to say. But I mean, I could, I could just throw out the number 15 man days, right? If, uh, if you're not working with all the material in the list every day um, or frequently, you know, then you're going to have to put in some serious time. And, and again, the time includes looking at the blueprint. It includes finding the material, right? And then you have to find some way to go through that material and, and uh, you know, build a summary that, that you can remember. Okay. Great. Um, so that's actually the only question that I have. Um, is there anything else that you would like to add before we close things down? No, I think that's. Um, I think we've covered everything. Uh, hopefully, that's uh, helped the attendees to understand you know, what they need to do to pass the exam, and uh, you know they can uh, you know come to to Fastlane and take some of our courses to help prepare. Perfect. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending. Um, we really appreciate you attending this presentation. Again, the PowerPoint and the presentation recording will be sent out to all attendees within a week. Um, so if you have any questions about that, feel free um, to respond back to that email. All of the attendees will be getting that. Um, thank you everybody for a great presentation and I hope you have a great rest of the week. Thanks, Joey. Thanks, Tegan. Tegan.